I'm Jo Clark and thanks so much for joining me today. This is the Redefining Midlife podcast, a podcast designed for the 40 plus woman who is determined to challenge society's myths and beliefs around midlife. It's for the woman who is inspired and ready to define midlife her way. Join me each week as I chat to health and wellness experts for up-to-date information on how to live well, as well as some special conversations with incredible everyday women redefining what midlife can look like. Here's to making our next half of life even better than the first. Stress management is one of my key pillars of wellness that my Better Than Before membership focuses on, and meditation is a powerful practice that reduces stress. Many of the women in the membership have incorporated meditation into their lives since becoming members. And since starting their practice, every single woman has felt so many positive benefits. Today's guest is Steph Watson, and she's actually the reason why the course of my life changed completely and why I left teaching after more than 30 years. I sought out Steph and I met Steph almost three years ago when I was stressed, burnt out from my job and dealing with the slow death of my mother. She taught both my husband and I meditation and it's that daily practice that's made such a profound impact on our lives. Steph is a Vedic meditation teacher based in the Noosa hinterland on Queensland's Sunshine Coast. And over the years, Steph has practiced and studied Vedic wisdom tradition, which is a 5,000 year old body of knowledge in both Australia and India. With a long held passion for health and wellbeing, Steph also works with the Queensland Health as communications lead and is studying a graduate diploma of psychology with the University of New South Wales. Steph lives in the Noosa hinterland on Queensland Sunshine Coast, where she runs regular courses, workshops and retreats. In our conversation, Steph and I chat about how she found her way to Vedic meditation, the different forms of meditation, and as well as how and why meditation has such incredible benefits to our mind, body and spirit. Hi Steph and welcome to the Better Than Before membership and our podcast episode as well. It's so lovely to have you here and we're going to be talking all things meditation today but to start us off before that just a bit of a story about what led you to meditation and to have meditation in your life and in particular Vedic meditation. Morning Joe. thank you for having me, good to see you and good to be here. Yes, yeah, so what led me to meditation I was one of those people for a very long time who thought things like yoga and meditation didn't really have an effect on me or they couldn't really provide me with anything that that I needed I was someone who I thought going to the gym going for a run things like that were the important things to do with your health and maintaining a healthy mind and body but there was a point was probably about seven or eight years ago now when I really wanted to go to India and to be honest this is where my um, path started in terms of finding meditation so it wasn't actually because I was feeling stressed or burnt out or there was this desire for me to go to India and from there I discovered a um, sort of pilgrimage or retreat that I wanted to go on. But in order to go, you actually had to be a Vedic meditator. And I'd never heard of Vedic meditation, but this desire to go was quite overwhelming. And it was a really no brainer scenario where I thought, I'll just learn Vedic meditation and go to India. And so it was actually a, a segue to, to fulfill this desire to go to, to go to India to learn Vedic meditation. But I remember I did the course and I came home and I just knew I was going to be practicing twice a day, every day, Vedic meditation, uh, following that. And it, that has definitely been what transpired. And I had actually been exposed or introduced to Vedic meditation. I realized years later that I'd been exposed and introduced to it full of times before actually learning because uh, that's always an interesting thing especially now that I'm teaching and people say I wish I'd done this sooner or I wish I'd learnt with my partner at this time or why isn't everyone doing this and you really do find whether it be Vedic meditation or or any other practice like this in your own time and it is very much around seeking it out for your own personal reasons and it 
it all just falls into place at the right time when you need it. And I guess that was the timing for me. And so those previous times where I'd been introduced to it by friends or I'd actually attended an intro talk. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is pretty interesting. But the next day, you know, got on with my life. Um, and that trip to India didn't end up being until about a year later from when I learned. And, yeah, I, I don't think I've missed – oh, I might – be able to count on this hand how many times you know I might have missed my second meditation since then so that's yeah and as I said I think I'd been doing a lot of yoga prior to learning as well so I think I was moving in that direction you know as I said I used to think that more intense physical exercise is what was best for my health but over time I had sort of gotten introduced to yoga and was practicing that and I feel like once you start moving in that direction all of these different practices and techniques and different groups of people and just different ways of interacting with the world and seeing the world start to open up and so you know you could say I was already moving in that direction and I guess yeah India is probably something that 10 years ago I, I might not have had the desire to do or or um or a place to visit but but yeah, there was just slowly uh, um, subtle shifts and changes that start to take place. And I've now been back to India a few times and, you know, would love to go back again one day. So it was that little charming idea to go to that country that led me to learn. And so what did you find straight away that, that meditation, the benefits, what, what were they for you? Yeah. And this is an interesting one because, as I said at the time, I it's not actually something that I sought out because I wanted to improve X, Y, or Z, or I thought that I needed it for any certain reason. But I remember when I dropped into my first meditation in the course, thinking, just having the experience, this is it. Like I didn't even know that I'd been searching for something but it resonated the experience of the meditation resonated so deeply I remember it was a very poignant moment in the meditation where I thought wow this is actually the answer to to everything and when I look back now I can see that I was a very stressed person walking into learning that technique at that time this was back in Sydney in Paddington and but at the time, I thought I was pretty grounded, didn't really take stress on. And I, you know, it's, it's very much a part of my nature as well. But I can also look back and see how stressed I was because the way that I was making decisions in my life, the certain patterns of behavior that I was stuck in, the ways of thinking, the the way that I was living. And um, there was a lot of stress there you know and I can see that mm. now mm. Um, and that's probably an important point that we will cover throughout this session is that we do normalize stress um, well, that's right it's it's it part, it's a part of your everyday and when it's a part of your everyday you don't realize you because you, you do take it on and that's that's certainly what I found and we'll probably as you said we'll discuss this further, yeah further into the conversation yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people ask me, you know, so how have things changed since you first learned? But the thing is that it's very, it's all these very gradual shifts and changes over time and that you also start to normalize. So you start to normalize living from that relaxed state of being as well, the more that you practice. But yeah, now looking back to when I first learned, my experience now is this greater greater sense of groundedness you know and greater sense of calm and confidence this beautiful broad awareness that I can take into everything that I do this greater sense of presence you know and that's when I'm on my own with my family whether I'm you know faced with a challenge at work whatever it is there's this greater sense and direct experience of love for yourself as well as those who you're interacting with in the world the biggest one as well is this great sense of joy and happiness again that you can carry through everything that you do and it really releasing stress from the nervous system which is what this technique that I practice and you practice and is all about is for me it, these are the things that uh, we naturally gain from it and are so important you know this ability to enjoy life more no matter if we're at the, 
the peak of an exciting experience or we're waiting for a bus or we're cooking dinner for ourselves and the family or we're, as I said, at work, whether we're in the garden, whether we're in a traffic jam, there's this greater sense of calm, steadiness, presence, enjoyment for the world that we're just carrying through all that we do. And when I look back to how I was living my life or how I experienced life previous to meditation, I was definitely still a happy person who enjoyed life and all these beautiful things, but it starts to become a 24 seven experience, you know, rather than dependent upon certain things that we're doing or certain people that we're with. And there's also this greater balance that we achieve. And that's really what this technique is all about too, is achieving balance or realizing that balance from within ourselves. So rather than being externally referenced and needing certain things in our environment, things like coffee or wine or, you know, a certain job or a a certain relationship or whatever it is to try and find fulfillment or find balance or um, there is this direct experience more and more and more of being of that coming from within of that being an internally experience. Yep. So practicing is one thing, Steph, and you know, you obviously got a lot of enjoyment and found that it was the right practice for you, but becoming a Vedic meditation teacher, isn't doing a, a weekend course, or it's not doing a six <laughs> week course. It's quite involved. So for people out there, if you can just explain to to us all, what does it actually mean to become a, what do you have to go through to become a a Vedic meditation teacher? Yes. So um, it is quite a, yeah, a, a long journey, but very much an enjoyable one too. So when you learn Vedic meditation, it's a four session course over four consecutive days and that's face to face with the teacher and from there you gain access to what we call the worldwide Vedic meditation community and you can resit that course again for free with any other Vedic meditation teacher you can attend group meditations with the teacher you learned from or any other Vedic meditation teacher offering them all around the world and then we always say when we finish the course as well you know this this is a wonderful technique that you've just learned and that can carry you through for the rest of your life and will continue to open you up to more and more and more. For those who are interested, there are also advanced knowledge courses that you can do as well. And so for some people, they will take up those advanced knowledge courses for their own personal growth and development and their extremely rewarding courses to undertake that are facilitated by my teacher Tom Knowles and for other people those courses become the foundations for moving into the role of teacher so they're actually prerequisites for the final or the culmination of all of those learnings is uh, three months in India moving through what is called rounding which is another advanced technique and lots of knowledge and sitting with your teacher for that period of time it's a very in-depth process those three months in India but basically prior there are these advanced knowledge courses that you complete as well which take a couple of years so it's a long process in that way as a um as a student of meditation as well. So it's still doing your twice daily meditation each day. It's both the the knowledge and wisdom because there's a whole body of knowledge and wisdom that's attached to Vedic meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's those learnings, but then it's also the direct experience of your daily practice and the advanced techniques on that side as well. We need both the experience and the knowledge to sort of expedite that process of of evolution I guess and stress release so the courses are are really beautiful for unfolding the greater states of consciousness that we move into as we continue meditating because as we keep meditating we become more aware that what is actually taking place is that evolutionary process and that is always forward moving you know in a direction of greater 
sophistication and capability and elegance and have this beautiful awareness of it at the same time. And yeah, the, those courses are really, are really powerful for that. Mm. So Vedic meditation, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the oldest form of meditation and from which all other forms have evolved and have been created. Is that, is that, am I on the right track with that? <laughs> so um, Veda means to know. So it, and the Vedas, they're said to be to date back, you know, at least 10,000 years. This knowledge and wisdom has been around since time itself. So since time immemorial and it is what we would refer to as universal knowledge. So no one owns this knowledge and wisdom. It is, you could call it the indigenous knowledge and wisdom or indigenous culture of the world, of the universe. It's very much so alive in India today. And a lot of people will ask, is it Indian or does it come from India? Um, and this is universal knowledge and wisdom that would have been around before all of what we know now as countries or certain land masses formed. So before all of those tectonic plates on the earth shifted and moved, this knowledge and wisdom was present. And when that shift happened, it so happened to be that within India, they continued the practices, continued sharing the knowledge and wisdom, passing it down you know, from master to student, father to son, and continued with the daily rituals. So, yes, people obviously have different views and takes on things in terms of claiming it is the oldest, but it it has been around since since time itself, since time immemorial. Mm. From what I've learned since listening to many of the teachings, there's such a correlation between the modern day thought leaders that people would probably be aware of, you know, yeah, Eckhart Tolle, your, your um, Gary Zukov, Wayne Dwyer, Marianne Williams, and there's a lot of correlation between the ancient teachings and what people are saying today. So that's what I've found really interesting since I've stepped into the world of Vedic meditation and the teachings. So if you could just explain, it's different to mindfulness meditation, which a lot of people would be familiar if they sit down and either have been taught or just have some space where they do mindfulness meditation or they listen to a particular app or some sort of recording. So what does a practitioner do in Vedic meditation and how does that differ? Yeah, so as you just mentioned, a couple of different techniques. There are so many different styles and practices and meditation techniques. And as you also said, what a lot of people will be most familiar with are those techniques where you do concentrate on something. It might be your breath or a candle or you're focusing on trying to stay in a certain present moment or you're being guided through something or told to visualize on something. There's and more often than, than not, there is that concentration or focus involved, or it might be a body scan where you're moving your awareness to focus on certain parts of the body. Vedic meditation is very unique in that it does not involve any concentration or any focus or any effort, really. So it's what we call an effortless letting go practice. So in Vedic meditation, what we do is we we use a mantra, but it's not mantra meditation in that in other techniques, there might be a, a mantra used where you focus on that mantra. So we do use a mantra and a mantra is made up of two Sanskrit words, man meaning mind and tra meaning vehicle. So the mantra is the mind vehicle that causes the mind to settle and what meditation really, you know, is all about in, in a more sort of broad summary is relaxation therapy. You know, it's, it's designed to cause us to, for the mind and body to relax. Um, and what is naturally taking place in Vedic meditation is that. So the, the mantra is this mind vehicle that causes the mind to settle through no effort or trying or concentration or focus of our own in the practice. 
And whatever the mind does, the body follows. So in Mm. Vedic meditation, when the mind settles to that least excited state and it's delivered there by the mantra, the body follows and moves into a state of deep rest and relaxation. And what's happening through that process is we are actually switching out of our sympathetic nervous system which is that fight or flight state that stress state which as we were saying most people have normalized to a degree we often would have that running in the background 24 7 that fight or flight stress state sympathetic nervous system activated without even realizing it and what happens when the mind settles and triggers the body to relax, the nervous system automatically switches out of that sympathetic state into the opposite function of the nervous system, which is the parasympathetic state. And that is the function of the nervous system, which is rest and digest. And so it's in that state that the body goes, ah, thank you. And we're finally able to start to let go of all of the stress, all of the fatigue, all of the things that we don't need to be holding on to anymore. And we start to deplete our inventory of stress that we've been carrying around for so long, you know, Um, and that's what we're experiencing in Vedic meditation. So there's, there's no concentration or effort or focus involved. And that is the extremely unique thing about it. It's effortless. And what's happening is there is this automatic, um, automatic triggering within our physiology of that switch from sympathetic to parasympathetic. And what's happening is, is we're transcending, which really means to go beyond, to transcend means to go beyond, transcending our thoughts, our patterns of behavior, Sending all of that and settling down into that least excited state and allowing the body to naturally let go of stress. And that parasympathetic state that we activate in Vedic meditation is actually our natural state. And it's a state from which we can derive all of our natural capabilities. It is a fairly new idea um, in the West that within each of us there is this infinite reservoir of creativity and intelligence and love and potential Um, uh, but what happens over time is um, you know it's the stress within the nervous system that clouds our ability to access all of that so in Vedic meditation we're returning back to that natural state we're depleting the nervous system of all the stress and we're regaining access to that which you know is always residing within us and when we come out of the meditation we start to more and more and more be able to move through the world with all of that potential with all of that creativity with all of that love and intelligence and you know all the all the reasons people come and come and learn the they are spontaneous benefits that we gain from the practice in the practice of vedic meditation we close our eyes we introduce the mantra into our awareness and there's obviously a certain technique that's associated with that and we let go let go we let go we let go we allow the process to carry out naturally it's a very natural natural process and there is this innate healing process that's taking place with, with that letting go of stress. It has profound benefits on our health, which I'll come to. But the other really unique thing about Vedic meditation is that thoughts are a part of the, a part of the practice. Mm. Thoughts are 100% a part of this practice. They're welcome, which again, in, in other practices, it's, you know, it, it might be, have the same intention of quietening down the mind. Um, But there is a technique that we can just gently, effortlessly come back to the mantra when thoughts are there. And thoughts in Vedic meditation are are really a a good thing because they're a sign that stress is leaving the nervous system. And that's probably one of the things that people are most surprised by when they come and learn. And for some people, it can be the challenge if they've tried other mindfulness techniques because there is this prior understanding that thoughts are bad or we want to banish thoughts or thoughts aren't a part of meditation or my mind's too busy. I can't meditate. I've got so many thoughts. I could never sit down and meditate for 20 minutes. 
I say bring your thoughts, bring, yes. bring it all. It's all a part of the practice. Sometimes, sometimes um, people too, Steph, they, um, yeah, sitting with your thoughts can be very uncomfortable. So yes. in many cases, people, yeah, not sure if thoughts should be there. So that can block some people. I'm thinking too much. So therefore I can't meditate. And the other issue that some people have, I've got so many thoughts. I don't want to sit with them. I don't know. I don't want to know what's yeah. going on in my head and sitting quietly. So that's that yeah. can be confronting for for people for two different. For reasons. sure, yeah, for sure. And you know that is the stress in our mm. nervous system trying to convince us of something you know we're not capable of doing this or it's too confronting like you said or I can't sit still or uh, you know fear can come up you know there can be all this whole raft of different emotions that that can come up and this this is a sign of of a lot of stress in the nervous system and also a very strong sign that we need to take that time out within our day to settle the mind, allow the body to rest and allow ourselves to let go of that stress mm-hmm. because it's very binding, it's very negating and it, it inhibits us from accessing all of the beautiful innate potential that, yeah. that is within ourselves. So for anyone listening who is having that experience, it's not a reason to justify not meditating it is the very reason I would be encouraging you to <laughs> seek out a meditation practice, you know, whatever that is going to be for you. And I always say that because people will often ask, what is the best, you know, meditation mm. technique? And obviously I'm heavily biased on the one that I practice be- simply because it's been my experience that I've gained so much from it. But really the best meditation practice you can do is the one that you enjoy because that is the one that you're going to want to do. And it is always with everything, but I'll draw it back to meditation. It is consistency with the practice that is going to deliver you the benefits. So if you can find a practice that you enjoy and it allows you to, to want to do it and, and, you know, and you find that time for yourself every day, it's that technique that's going to deliver you the benefits because we can't just meditate once mm. and okay, stress-free nervous system enlightened all of my, my worldly problems are solved. You know, it yep. is, we have been accumulating stress for an incredibly long period of time. We are taking in stress all day, every day, and we need to find that time and space for ourselves each day to allow ourselves to continue to deplete that inventory of stress and to come back into balance. And, um, you know, it's that which is going to deliver us the benefits and allow us to enjoy life more. So you're talking about the benefits a lot. And and I know you mentioned that it, it will decrease the fight flight system of the body, the natural body, but yeah. science is catching up <clears throat> now with the benefits as well, because now we've got science to prove that certain things are happening within our body when we are meditating. And this happens for a variety of other forms of meditation as well. Specifically, a change in the brain waves can happen. The slowing down of breathing and heart rate can occur to the point. I'll just quickly tell a story of my husband and I learned at the same time. And it was a few months back, Philip donated some blood and it was in the morning and he thought he'd slip in a quick second meditation before he headed off to do his work because we usually practice first thing in the morning. When what? he was giving, <laughs> when he was giving blood, um, the staff there got very concerned because all of a sudden, you know, his breathing rate dropped, and the blood was not being pumped out of his into the bag like it was mm. beforehand. It everything had slowed right down, and they sort of went to rouse him to to make sure that you know this poor man hasn't had suddenly had a stroke or a heart attack or was slowly slipping <laughs> slipping away from them it was the fact that he was in a deep meditative state and everything had slowed mm. down and the minute that he was roused again bang it, it all so that's that's like a mini science experiment that wasn't meant to occur but did and they were blown away by what had happened yeah so if you can just it talk is- about some of the things that actually happen. So we know brain waves change, we know heart rate. What else goes on in the body when you're in a deep meditation? Yeah, it is such a powerful practice. And just as another 
similar little anecdotal story I actually taught another couple recently and they were actually talking about how poor their sleep usually is Mm -hmm. and they can never experience this deep sleep and they also wore those Apple watches that that tell you what your sleep is doing and they said for the first time ever they both their watches entered or showed up that they were in that that the deepest level of sleep but it was in meditation so they actually wow. reached a point of rest the, the body detected that deepest state of rest um, that they had never experienced for in their own sleep within the meditation that is another unique thing about this practice it's actually providing us with a level of rest that is beyond that which we gain from sleep so I always encourage my students, you know, even if you have to set your alarm half an hour earlier in the morning to get it done, do that because the rest that you gain from the practice is, is more profound than sleep. Um, and what's happening in that process is basically the mind and coming back to science, you know, catching up, as you were saying, this is a, a principle of quantum physics that the Vedic worldview has known since time immemorial, that the mind comes first. So what happens is the mind perceives some sort of threat and a threat is really something that we feel challenged by in that particular moment or not fully capable of responding to. And so the mind perceives a threat and it prints out fight or flight so that we can respond to that situation what's perceiving as a life-threatening situation Uh, what's happened over time is a lot of our threats that we're perceiving or the the mind is perceiving are imagined psychological threats and they are part of our all day every day you know it might be the traffic jam it might be not getting enough um, sleep it might be not having enough work financial pressures, family pressures, a social situation that that makes us uncomfortable, the pollution in the air, the electronic magnetic fields that we're exposed to. It's, you know, it's all of these things that are a part of our everyday life and they're not going to go anywhere. You know, we we want our jobs. We want to be able to, uh, you know, afford to buy food and enjoy time with our family and friends and get in the car and go to a different destination. And um, it's these things that just keep layering up and layering up and layering up as stressful situations that the mind is perceiving. And so it doesn't matter if it is the saber-toothed tiger or the 100 unread emails in our inbox, the mind perceives these things as a threat and it prints out fight or flight. It prints out the stress response because it thinks that the emails or the traffic jam or the depleting funds in the bank account are going to maul us. And so it's like, right, fight or flight, I just need to, I need to get through this, this stressful situation or this life-threatening situation. And so it prints out fight or flight. And what's happening in our body when that fight or flight prints out is our five long-term survival systems in, in the body start to shut down. So that's the reproductive system, cellular repair function, the digestive system, immune system and the prefrontal cortex of the brain that front part of the brain that is responsible for long-term decision making reason logic all of the good things because basically the body is like why would I bother digesting that meal that you just had or producing those cells that you may or may not need in five years time if I could die at any moment you know there's this life-threatening situation in front of me and so I've just got to focus on that I don't have energy to send to all of these long-term systems in the body and we know that experience when we're stressed you know our heart rate as we're saying will start to increase some people we might get hot and sweaty we've got this tunnel vision we just need to focus on this one thing we lose that broad perspective of our awareness Um, or for some people it's flee fight or flight it's the flight you might remove yourself from a situation get quiet for some people it's getting angry defensive you know might want to physically punch something Um, it's it's all these experiences of stress we're very familiar with and so what's happening is we're triggering that fight or flight response in our nervous system um, all day, every day, basically. 
through these experiences that are coming into our awareness, that the mind eating is life-threatening. And the more that that's happening, obviously, the harder it becomes to respond to, to life in, in, um, in a way that isn't repetitive and redundant. So it is stress of these life experiences we just keep taking on and, and the stress layers up in the nervous system. And, and that's when we have those experiences as well where we just feel like we're just staying above water or the smallest thing can trigger us and causes us to react or you know we feel like we're sort of pushed up against a brick wall and, and just can't can't respond anymore um, and we need to you know we need to uh, whatever it is that we do to respond that that it really isn't the most productive way to deal with that certain situation in front of us so that's what's happening in the body and you can see that as well in all of the um big health issues that we see today you know if we think about the fact that when we're experiencing stress on a daily basis like that and triggering that fight or flight response perpetually and normalizing living in that state and those long-term survival systems in the body not functioning properly we can see that in the prevalence of all the major diseases that we see today all the major health issues it's as it's cancer, rapid aging, pain responses in the body not working properly, Parkinson's, infertility, gut issues, autoimmune disorders. Um, and so the technique of Vedic meditation has such profound benefits on our health as well because what it's doing is, is allowing us to, to stabilise ourselves more and more and more from and move have the ability to move from that parasympathetic state where all of the functions within the nervous system also within our consciousness start to come back online and work properly um, because as I've been explaining this is what's being triggered when we meditate that switching from the sympathetic to parasympathetic but the more that we meditate these are things that don't just stay within the meditation they start to actually become our reality our experience of of life you know, 24 seven. So it's very interesting that these ancient techniques and the wisdom within them that have been around, you know, since time itself, we're seeing science catch up to it just mm -hmm. now and provide those sort of justifications around it. And, you know, when, when we were younger, it's not really something that we grew up with as well, you know, learning or having an appreciation of, stress and what is stress and why is it important to deplete stress it's wonderful to see it coming through the schools now and kids growing up with an understanding of where their emotions come from and how important it is to sort of have calm responses to things and um but it wasn't a subject taught in school when no, when we were no, younger it and it, there just wasn't that awareness no. of, of the importance around it and certainly when I was teaching, that was something that I, I did for a number of years is it was a mindfulness meditation based with a, an app that, that many people would be oh, familiar beautiful. with, called Smiling Ones. And for the children, that was one of their favourite times of the day. It was mm. after lunch coming in to do their daily meditation, following the guided meditation. Yeah. So it, it is lovely, as you said, that, that it's becoming more accepted. We've got science catching up. And for some people, they need to have that, the language of science cuts through any spiritual aspect or it could be a religious aspect that people might be conflicted with yeah. and, and it really becomes a common language that people will understand and see the benefits of. So we can talk all day about what we believe the benefits are purely from what the ancient wisdoms are saying and the teachings are saying and our personal realities. But when you've got science backing it up, that's for many, that is what is going to get them over the line to try any form of meditation, whether it be Vedic sure. guided um, yeah, so that thanks for explaining all that, Steph. A number of the the members in in our group were were just wondering, and some of the things that you've already discussed. Big thing about how you switch thoughts off, and as you explain in Vedic meditation, and you're you're just speaking as a Vedic meditation teacher, but that whole idea of thoughts is a worry for some people. But I think that we've covered that, the whole idea of. I'm not good at meditating because I've got thoughts, but as you explained, that's part yeah. and accepted within the practice 
of Vedic yes. meditation. Yeah, so that's a very much a unique part of Vedic meditation. It's probably a reason why it's so enjoyable too. Mm. And, you know, why Vedic meditation is becoming so popular is because it is enjoyable and so people keep doing it and when you keep doing it you start to experience the benefits mm. and so you know someone might have an experience of meditation where they're told to shut out thoughts or stop thinking and you can't it's the nature mm. of the mind so you know if someone were to have that experience that might then be their perception of meditation in general but there are so many different practices and techniques and so you know, I would encourage people if you have had that experience, don't let that um, discourage you from trying another practice where you could have a very different experience and really enjoy it and really gain some benefits and, you know, want to keep practicing because it is, it's such an important, such, such an important part of, of what we should all be doing on a daily basis. You know, we there's, we take care of our physical health in so many different ways. We brush our teeth, we shower our bodies. There's all these different facets to, to keeping healthy and the health of the mind is so, so important mm -hmm. because, as I was saying, the mind comes first. Quantum physics would say consciousness is primary, matter is secondary or consciousness controls or, or governs matter. That would be mm -hmm. the language that science would use. But, you know, we, it's the mind and the body. You can also say and if we're taking care of our mental well-being, that is going to shift, change, upgrade physical health as well as our whole experience of life. That's right. Good. Yeah, the, the body doesn't understand the difference between perceived threat and a real threat. And therefore yeah. those chemicals that it will flood the body with um, can be, if you're living yeah. in that whole state of fight or flight all the time, your body is continually dealing with all of those various chemicals that are flooding your body. Um, and the meditation for me exactly. has been a lovely time where I can take a step back because I started during a time of burnout. I was experiencing from work, going through my mother dying. I was going through my children, you know, leaving the nest, my whole, mm. who am I going to be now when a I'm not? A change. You know, um, yeah. So for me, it was a lot of a busy mind and you don't realize how busy it is until you start to calm it down. So yeah, um, it, it is, it was truly it, a, a completely life-changing experience once I learned. Another question that somebody had asked was, what's the best time to meditate? And again, there is, there's a practice in Vedic meditation that, that will answer that. Um, but do you know whether it be morning, afternoon, or is it just whenever you can? Yeah, so um, with Vedic meditation specifically, it is a twice daily 20-minute practice. So one in the morning sometime, one in the afternoon or evening sometime. And in terms of ideals, there are always ideals that I share with my students. And for the morning, it would be first thing because everything gets better after you meditate. But also if you do it first thing before your day starts, then you know it's done. And so there's, there's no risk of it being missed in the morning. And in the afternoon, I would be recommending before dinner sometime and it goes for the same with the morning we wouldn't want to um, meditate on a because when we're meditating we're settling the mind we're settling all those functions within the within the body and obviously that the digestive experience um, or process takes you know takes a lot of energy so ideally before any sort of heavy meal as well as before something like coffee or alcohol because, um, again, they can be very stimulating and we're wanting to settle. And also in the afternoon, I would say it's nice to do in terms of a second meditation because you're taking all of those benefits from the practice into your, into your afternoon and sharing dinner time with your family or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, rather than just doing it shortly before bed and, and falling asleep. As well, because Vedic meditation does provide such profound rest some people find that doing it too closely to sleeping actually disrupts the sleep because they come out of the meditation and they have this, this energy. Rested. yep yeah. that was one of the first things actually Steph that I found benefits that I could feel personally not only was it just I wasn't as reactive and wasn't feeling as as anxious it was the sleeping within the first two days I noticed a massive change with how I was able to fall asleep and, and stay yeah. in a in state of rest for a lot longer than what I was used to. 
Mm. Yeah, because we're providing ourselves those two pockets of rest in the day, that's where the, the processing takes place. That's where the letting go takes place. That's where the stress release, digesting, purifying, whatever word you want to use, mm. we're allowing ourselves to do that in those two pockets in the day. So there isn't that pressure on the sleep state to do all of that, to do all of that processing. So what can actually take place is more effective rest, more effective sleep. A lot of, um, a lot of people have similar feedback. They really notice how their sleep changes. And again, it's something that I think we normalize too, like not getting a good night's sleep. It's quite common and, and it can be very easily normalized, whereas we really should be sleeping all the way through through the night, not getting up through the night to go to the bathroom or because, you know, some, our mind's triggered and we should be waking up fully rested um, and feeling like we, we had a good sleep. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are some ideal and with Vedic meditation, it is 20 minutes twice a day, but again, and as I even say to my students, you also, this needs to be a practice that works in for you. So especially for parents with young kids, the first thing in the morning doesn't work for them because there's kids coming into the room or they've got to get up and it's school time. And there's a whole long list of things that need to be done, but at 9 30, the house is free, everything's done, you know, there's time there. And so that might be when they do their first meditation. Beautiful, perfect. Uh, whenever you can make it work for you is the best time, you know. So there are ideals and the ideals are all around supporting you in terms of gaining the most from the practice. Um, but, you know, doing one meditation at 9.30 is better than not doing it at all just because you couldn't get it in at, at 6 a.m. in the morning or whenever it is. Um, and as I said earlier, it's consistency with the practice that's going to bring all of the benefits to life. So it's always about what works for you, when can I fit it in, you know, and it, it could change every single day because our life changes every day as well. True. So you might do one meditation first thing in the morning, on, on one day and the next day, for whatever reason, you don't get to it till 10 o'clock. All good. Like, and there's, there's, we shouldn't be bringing stress into when we're going to get it done either because that is counterintuitive to what we're actually trying to create. So it's whenever works for people at the end of the day, but timing-wise as well, like consistency with it, I would be saying, you know, integrate a practice that you can do every day and mm. ideally twice a day because that is how all of those benefits come to life. And if you think about it, 20 minutes twice a day, it's 3 or 4% of our 24-hour day. And it's about, I use the language, investing in that 40 minutes or 3 or 4% of our day. Invest in that so that we can shift, change, upgrade the remaining 96 97% mm. of our day. And it's really not much at the end of the day, 40 minutes for the benefits that you receive on the other end. Um, but yeah, it is about finding a technique that you enjoy, that works for you and that you can integrate so that you are doing it consistently every day and ideally twice a day because um, it's consistency with the practice that will deliver you what you're seeking. Excellent. And that, that sort of led into the last question, how often should you meditate? So it doesn't matter what practice that you choose to do. It, it is at consistency. And to also think because I think many of us Steph can make an excuse in our head blame something or complain about something why we can't get it done and it's really an, a story that we tell ourselves so it's it is yeah having some flexibility and I love that about the practice um for me now it's I'm coming up to my end of my almost my third year Steph of, wow. of yeah. <laughs> almost my metaversary coming up soon yeah um, on just that I some days I can't get two in and that's okay mm -hmm. but I really love getting yeah. at least one in that's usually a priority and for me it is if I do it first thing in the morning I clean my teeth so scrape my tongue first clean my teeth mm -hmm. and then bank straight in straight into my meditation and that sets that's my routine so I think Beautiful. you've got to find something that's going to set sort out for your day and I did that when I was working as well it, it wasn't since I um, stepped away from my teaching career I did that earlier as well I think yeah for people yeah. to work out what's going to suit them and that whole 
doing it consistently and holding yourself accountable. Uh, and I know some of the apps that they that are out there, they even have something where they can hold themselves accountable. It'll it'll tick tick it off a calendar for you, but you can do it yourself. That's something that everybody can do. You know, cross it off on their own calendars so they can see because the brain loves seeing and it rewards themselves. I've done it again today. And that's another little kick that that we can give ourselves. Yeah, and everyone has a different approach to it. For some people, I say, you know, if you, if you work off the calendar, like you just said, set a, an appointment for yourself, mm. you know, for meditation. The, the wonderful thing about Vedic meditation, you know, is that we can do it anywhere, anytime. Mm. Yep. So, you know, it's not, we don't, and once you learn, you're fully self-sufficient, confident daily meditator. So you don't, need an app you don't you know your teacher is always there to provide you that guidance and support when you feel you need it um but you don't need to be in a certain classroom with a certain teacher at a certain time wearing certain clothing tuned into a certain channel you know you're sitting sitting with your hands in a certain way cross-legged you don't need that no Mm. I've done it in a car, I've I've practiced on a plane I've yeah there's been a variety of different places where I've done a meditation That's it. Anywhere where you can sit down and get comfortable, being comfortable with Vedic meditation is really important too. Anywhere you can sit down, get comfortable for 20 minutes, you can meditate. It can be at the beach. It can be, as you said, those different plane, car. There can be construction noise outside. The the kids can be watching TV in the next room and it's blaring. Outside noise is no barrier to to the practice. Once you learn, it's like this little tool that you carry around within yourself and you can sit down and do it anywhere anytime and it's it's called um, a householder's technique um, because it it you know it's designed for for people like us with jobs and families and responsibilities and you know busy days and it's it's been designed in this very specific way 20 minutes twice a day because it is easy to integrate. It is manageable. 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. It's it's so doable. It's not about taking an hour out of the morning. If I said this was an hour or two hour practice twice a day, you know, it wouldn't be, <laughs> no one would be doing it. And so, and that's the thing, finding a, finding a technique that works for you that you can do every day and that's effective and you're experiencing the benefits. That's, you know, that's right. You'll, you'll, you'll get a lot more out of it than scrolling for 20 minutes on your phone or sitting down exactly. in front of the telly at the end of the, you know, at some point in time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I if people, Steph, want to learn more about Vedic meditation, where could they go? What's the process? And then, you know, what are your details if they want to get into contact with you directly? Yeah. Yeah. So there um there are Vedic meditation teachers all around the world. Um, and so we've all been t- taught to share the practice in a very specific way. And so if you put into Google meditation and wherever your area is hopefully one one will pop up near you and I would just recommend reaching out to them and saying that you're interested in learning and they can share more with you it's always taught over those four consecutive days four sessions the first session is is always private and that's where you receive your personal mantra and the technique for using it and the following three sessions and days is you know could either be private or in a small group Um, however the teacher facilitates that but yeah, I would recommend Google or I can, I'll provide my details and if anyone wants to reach out to me, I can put them in touch with a teacher um, in their area or closest to them because we do sort of all know who each other are and where we are. And so my email is hello at stephwatson.com.au or um, Steph Watson, like www.stephwatson.com.au, I think. <laughs> I'll put. I'll make sure I, I put them in the show notes for the podcast, and also um, yes. yeah, the ladies in my membership will we'll get get all the details. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, just double check that. For you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, well, thanks um, so yeah, much. There's, it's. Oh, you're welcome, Joe. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you and sharing all about the practice and meditation in general. And I hope that it does inspire a little something in in anyone listening to to seek out seek out a practice whether it be Vedic meditation or or otherwise just to start to 
let go of some of the stress mm. and um and find a find a um even more enjoyable um way of living oh that's fabulous well it's certainly become a non-negotiable in my life i will I'll right. always make sure meditation is a part of of my life and it's certainly yeah, changed in in so many ways yeah and i thank really you from my, as, a, <laughs> as a student to my teacher yeah uh you know i really appreciate all of the time and uh, that you put into yeah providing providing all of the students that you work with all of the support that they need oh you're welcome joe it's i it's actually speak of you and and Philip is some of my star students. <laughs> you, um, it's so wonderful to see, you know, the shifts and changes that you've experienced mm. and how much you enjoy it and how much it means to you. And that's what it's it's all about at the end of the day, you know, mm. is, is, um, is passing on this ancient knowledge and wisdom. It's not something that I claim to own or I feel entirely privileged that I'm in a position where I can pass it on to other people to to gain the benefits from and enjoy as well you know there is is, this um there is this beautiful lineage beautiful tradition from which you know this knowledge and wisdom has been passed down and yeah i'm i feel very fortunate that i can continue to to share it with with other people awesome keep sharing all right thanks so much for joining us thanks joe thanks so much for listening and sharing your time with me today I'd love you to hit subscribe on Apple Podcast or your favourite podcast app to keep spreading these empowering messages. Please share this podcast with other incredible midlife women in your world. Join me again next week for another redefining midlife conversation. Thanks again for tuning in.